Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Janet Wilson, the, the president of NCEP, and it's my, my great privilege to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Mike Watts, whose topic is My Family and Other Discientics. The Scientics. Uh, Professor Watts is currently Professor of Education at Brunel University of London, where he's responsible for academic leadership in the department's international program and the STEM Education Research Group. He's a fellow of the Institute of Physics and has been awarded a National Teaching Fellowship for Excellence in Teaching. He's been consultant to many universities internationally, such as the Teaching Council of Ireland, the National University of Ireland and University College Cork. He's been external examination, examiner for university programs across Europe, as well as Argentina, Australia, Brazil and Canada. He supervised over 50 PhD students and been external examiner to a number of awards at PhD and MPhil level at national and international institutions. Mike Watts has been very active in publishing in the field of formal and informal science education and has co-authored some 15 books and up to 40 texts on schools, science and education research, as well as about 250 articles, not to mention book reviews, paid conference papers and public lectures. In 2021 alone, he published four co-authored books on pedagogical topics, such as a pedagogy of transgression and on science education, such as debates in science and becoming scientific and um, science and success, stories of British Asian girls. And he's solo editor of an essay collection on mobile learning from pedagogy to practice. In tonight, today's lecture, he will introduce members of his own family and the term dysciencia, by which he means people who are troubled by scientific concepts and processes and have difficulties, therefore, in accessing issues in science. So just to let you know, he has agreed to take questions. Please use the um, hand, the raised hand function, and you can also um, introduce questions into the chat function on the Teams platform. I'm delighted to uh, welcome Professor Watts and I'm looking forward to his lecture now, as I'm sure you all are as well. Janet, thank you very much indeed. That, I, and it's a real privilege to be here, so I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, I'm, I'm broadcasting, as it were, <laughs> badly <laughs> from, from, my, from my family home here, from my what's called my den. There's a sign on the door that says, enter and die. So it's, it's my, my mm -hmm. space here, so welcome to it. Um, I am going to, I've, I've got a whole series of slides, which I, I'm going to sort of um, shoot through, uh, not least of all, because we've lost some time with my incapacity to be able to get this slideshow on. Margaret, would you, would you put the first slide up for me, please? Just to uh, orientate you, what I'm really talking about is public understanding of science, the, the, the general population level of public knowledge about science, which in the literature around all of this tends to be uh, discussed in quite negative terms, i.e. the public doesn't understand science. And for, for very good reason, we can perhaps understand that, that position. It's not at that level that I'm talking, though, or the second one down, which is called science literacy. And science literacy tends to be aimed at specific groups, um, those people who, for, for example, have um, health issues, or are interested in climate change or something of that nature. So it tends to it tends to focus rather more on groups in, in, in terms of the literacy and functional terms. My own personal pre, uh, predisposition is, is to talk about people. Uh, and I've given it the acronym PLUS, People's Learning Understanding of Science. So it's rather than PLUS, it's PLUS. Um, the next one, Margaret, please. My start position is that science impacts upon everybody. Uh, it's really difficult to avoid issues of science. And to that extent, um, I noticed that Saima's in the in the audience. Hi, Saima. Um, she and I have talked about people having a science life in very small ways or in intermediate ways or in very large ways. And you can see that I've used uh, small s science 
um, science and then larger science at the other end. So what I'm really doing is separating out people who, for whom science is, is a very minor part of their lives. They get involved with it at some levels, right the way through to people who are in professional science. Um, and they're the biggest science people. I'm really talking about the people in the red end of the spectrum uh, where they have very little or have very little inclination towards engaging in science. And uh, it's, it's always worth plugging the book. It <laughs> so Lydia Watts there um, at, the, at the bottom. You, you get your plugs in very early in this game, I think. OK, next one, Margaret, please. There's a, a, a group in the States, uh, John Falk and Lynn Dirking, who actually, th th they have a, a, a calculation that your formal education in science or one's formal education in science occupies something like 15% of your life at most. They have a second paper, actually, where they talk about the 95% of, of life that's outside of formal science education, schooling, college, whatever. I've gone for the rather more conservative bit here, that 85% of, of an ordinary person's life is, is away, is, is outside of that. But we still get it. I mean, for all of the kinds of work that museums do, the National History Museum or the National Science Museum, um, all sort of general local museums do, aquaria, zoos, city farms, study centres, there's a whole range of raft of, of, of um, provision uh, out there that deals with informal science learning in, in many, many ways. So I'm, I'm interested in the 85%, or if, if you take Falcon Dierkin's um, later calculation, I'm interested in the 95% of life that, that's not engaged in formal science education. I do get involved in, in, in school science, and, and it, it's interesting to do so. But for the sake of today, and uh, for the, generally speaking, the kind of research that we like doing, it's, I say we because it's, um, it's Saima and I who, who tend to push these uh, ideas along for each other. Um, it's, it's the 95. It's the, all of that stuff at the bottom of the, uh, of the iceberg. Next one, please. There we are. Thank you. Meet my, meet my wife, Ruth, uh, and my daughter, Rosie. And uh, they're, they're posed on the, um, the balcony of uh, an apartment we own in Umbria, in Italy overlooking the vines, as you can see, in the groves of the uh, Tiber Valley. And, and that, uh, that, that will become important a bit later. Uh, and the clouds are the point of focus here. Next slide, please. Oh, very nice. There on the, uh, we're here we're, we're, we're on the North Downs, uh, just above where we live in uh, Rygate. And this is a, this is a preoccupation, we, we tend to walk uh, and then go for Sunday lunch or in a pub that's nearby and so on. But the, the, the point about the, the slides are, it evoked the question from Rosie, what are clouds actually made of? And Ruth followed that up by saying, well, why do they have flat bottoms? Why are they, you know, in strata in the, in the way that they are? And it, it's a perfectly ordinary question. Uh, and they turned to me as being somebody who's supposed to have an answer for these things. Uh, uh, the, 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 the expectation being that um, somehow Mike's going to be able to sort of provide them with an explanation for these things. Uh, next one, please. And I make a start. And I, I, I talk to them about clouds being made up of different forms of water, largely ice and, and water droplets and vapour. And, and they say, well, yeah, that, I can see why we could see that. And I said, well, actually, you can't see water vapor because that's actually invisible. So there has to be some other 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 form of condensation taking place up there, and it's cold. And and I I introduce all these different kinds of ideas, and I say largely because the there's a mixture of stuff up in clouds that is often dust grit, sand pollen, and and, and so on. And and they listen to all of this very patiently. Next one, please. And what I'm doing really is, is, is trading on the fact that they're intelligent women and they're listening to this, what I call an assemblage of terms. I, I'm, I'm kind of throwing these words at them, water, vapour, droplets, invisible air, cool, ice, condensed and so on. And I kind of expect them to have familiarity with all of that. Um, there might be vapour and condense would be things that uh, they're, they're trying to think, what does he mean by that? Um, 
and I, 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 you know, I elicit some kind of forms of interest because I see them nodding and they ask different kinds of questions and say, well, why does that happen? And what happens there? And so on. And why do they move? And um, what, 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 what's, what's stopping the moving if they're not, if they're just hanging in the air there like that and so on. Next one, please. And so I persist, I go on and I talk about the height and the different temperatures uh, and they say, well, water's not lighter than air, so why does it stay up? And then I say, well, OK, you know, there's a kind of different layers of warm air and um, it rising from the surface of the air and the cold air rests on top of the warm air and then the warm air moves itself through the clouds and they churn and so on. And they, they listen to all of this. But eventually, uh, probably like as you're doing right this minute as well, that, that you, they they be, they begin to get kind of discontented with this. There's a lot of buts start to appear, and um, it, it's what Piaget called disequilibrium. Um, there's a degree of dissatisfaction with what's happening. They go quiet for a minute, and then, <laughs> and then they switch conversations. It was a memorable time when my. Uh, we were walking along the top of the dams and then we actually turned the corner and there was the pub. Um, and my wife said, oh, great, saved by the bull. <laughs> Which, <laughs> yes, please be. Next one, next one, please, Margaret. What I didn't do, what I, I resisted from doing was talking about convection, vaporization. I didn't move from micro to macro from the molecular explanations to large scale atmospheric pressures. I didn't talk about cloud formations, vapor trails, aerosol cans, clouds, bubbles in a fizzy drink, because the, the, the clouds of a sort, between clouds on the earth and those in the atmosphere of say distant Jupiter. And I guess that they weren't ready to make all of that kind of move really. They were not prepared in my terms for the hard mental lifting required. They lost interest, they disengaged, they turned away, talked about lots of other things, and we had lunch. Next one, please. I could have, it, I, it, it has been the case that we've had similar kinds of questions about a whole range of different kinds of things. So Rosie stood in the Isle of Sainsbury's, which is close to us here, and said, was looking at a packet and said, well, what exactly is a gluten? Why would I worry about it being gluten free? What's what's that all about? Uh, and she saw the look on my face as I'm beginning to launch into one of these explanations, uh, and she immediately, you know, regrets having asked the question. And she she actually what she actually said was, um, uh, look look look, I don't really need to know. She said two clicks on my phone and I'll find out. So don't 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 worry about it, Dad. You know, forget it. Um, <laughs> or I could simply walk around and, if you know, sort of. Uh, information systems in uh, in, in uh, Sainsbury's and ask the question there you know I don't I, forget it I don't, don't don't pretend I didn't ask what's the difference between a vaccination and inoculation why do they spray stuff on apples what is a hip replacement I, one of our neighbors had a hip replacement and uh, what do they actually do what, what bit do they replace <laughs> no, no. how does it work um, Locally to us as well, there's been a controversy about the fracking for oil and what is, what is it? What, does they, what, what happens? So there's a range of different kinds of questions and you can see from those that they're not anything that's any particularly strange, they're the sorts of things that ping into life uh, for all of us. Uh, what is coronavirus? Why do we eat five a day? Five what? <laughs> How much of five? do we eat today? Why, why do they say fine? And so on. It, it's, uh, <laughs> we're bombarded with a range of different kinds of messages that come through. And the issue inside all of this is, is what's the science behind it? One of the favourite sayings, as if you recall, on uh, the, by politicians and so on, as they gave their coronavirus briefings of five o'clock of an evening, was, we follow the science. And one of the questions that was commonly asked at home is, well, what is the science? Why do we, what are we following? Which bit of it? <laughs> what do we know about it? What are probiotics? And then there was a, an immortal question, which was, <laughs> what's leather made of? And when you explain what leather's made of, oh, oh, really? Oh, no. Oh, no, thank you. Very, no, go away. Ugh, yuck. Um, 
And the, one of the ones that I really, really couldn't answer, which is what happens to our energy when we die? Uh, and and I, I was really confounded by that one. Um, so the point about that is for clouds, it could be any other kind of question that impacts upon our lives. What is climate change? Da, 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 what do we have to worry about? And for Rosie and, and, and Ruth, you, you, any other two people in, in, that you bump into in the street or you happen to be talking to in a, in a, in a coffee bar or anything else. Um, next one, Margaret, please. So what in the literature, what I think I'm talking about in terms of dyscientia is a turning off. There's a point of interest and then a point of rejection. People will understand that what they're asking is is a science question, but then they quickly just turn away from it again. Well, what is it? I, I'm I've, I'm not interested anymore. Thank you, but no thank you. Disengaged. In the literature, it's called low academic hardiness or a non-commitment to learning science. So it's a commitment issue. It's a, a persistence issue, low investment, low cognitive effort, low science efficacy. Uh, the word science capital is, is often used. It, it has a slightly broader meaning uh, that, that, that I'm investing with it now. But science capital is one of those expressions that is now very much in the literature. And people who have a fixed conceptual framework, there's been a lot of work done on things called misconceptions or alternative conceptions as to why people come up with a variety of different answers for what we in science might think of as being a fairly settled affair. They don't. Uh, that There's a range of different things that are, that are there. And I, I suppose what I'm really trying to do is that, that is to capture this, 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 this sense of disengagement and, and walking away from it and why that might happen. Next one, please. I understand quite clearly that dyscientia has the same overtones as dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dyspraxia. And I, I, they tend to have neurological issues attached to them, and I'm not suggesting that here at all, um, because I simply don't know, I, and I can't imagine that there are neurological issues involved in this, but it has that overtone. I'm rather more interested in the, the prefix dis, as in dysfunctional, a kind of a dysfunctional approach to science as opposed to anything slightly stronger than that. So what I think I'm talking about is a kind of a syndrome of disengagement. Um, the difficulties that people have, the proposition here is that Sorry, I've got a huge echo. The people waiting in the lobby to be let in, and I can't let them in, otherwise they'll lose the slides. Can someone else let them in? I'll have a go. I know they can make, make some sense of what's happening. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm talking about people who have difficulties with uh, all of these issues within science. Um, just the very approach, the name, the word science itself, you know, I, I'm not a science person. It's not, science, oh, no, 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 I didn't. I've stopped doing that a long time ago. I mean, you know, that was you were forced to do it at school. Um, but really, I'm not I'm not a science person. I, I, I'm an arts person or I'm, I'm something else. You know, I like music and as if they're in, in opposition to each other, which we know they're not. But it, it, it has that sense to it when you're talking to people and they, oh, um, what, what, I'll come to it in a minute, but one of my um, one of the, the approaches that I, I, I favour most are, are something called kitchen conversations, and I I'm, I'm known for pestering people, going round to their houses, drinking their coffee, and talking to them about their gardening and what they think you know plant biology is all about, or talking to them about um, you know climate change or whatever it happens to be that they want to talk about and engaging them in, in, in discussions. And as soon as it moves into those, t they know me, so that they, they, they expect the fact that I'm actually going to want to talk to them about science. And I tell them I am, um, it's not a secret, uh, but you, the, it's almost apologetic. Oh, sorry, Mike, no, no, oh gosh, no, I, I, don't, I, I don't do so, I'm not so, and that's all. And you get this, this instinctive barrier cropping up uh, as to why that they don't feel as if they're able to have a conversation about this. So I'm suggesting that it's not a, a condition, but a syndrome, and a syndrome in the sense that it's a collection of, of issues that people have and difficulties 
that they have. It's, so it's, 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 it's at that level that I'm talking. Next one, please, Margaret. I want to introduce a couple of terms as I go along. Checking time just to see how I'm doing. Um, assemblages comes out of the work of Deleuze and Guattari, which is a, 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 at least it, be, it, it, it rose to prominence in that. And, and it has the sense of, of assemblages, you might, for those who, who are artistic, um, assemblage art. And what I'm suggesting is that people, if you ask them a question, why, what is a gluten and you know, what, what do you think glutens are or whatever it happens to be, if you turn the tables and ask them, you can see people scratching at, I say it's scratching around, but they begin to try to haul in a range of different things and different ideas that they've got. So we do the same things, by the way. If I was, and I'm going to in a moment, <laughs> ask you all a question. <laughs> when I ask that question, you can, you can sense yourself bringing in, oh, things I've heard, uh, something I read, something I saw on TV, something somebody said to me, and so on. You know, my neighbor over the garden fence said something about it. So, for example, if you if you ask some people about what, what do you think um, insulin does in terms of, say, late onset diabetes, w what is the role that insulin plays in that? And what is your what are your blood sugar levels or something that you, you can ask any kind of question and and people begin to assemble from the various scraps of knowledge and understanding trying to bring it together as a as a as a, a, a kind of synthetic whole and try to make something of it and scratch around to get all of these bits in and i've called it an assemblage and it, in, in the literature it's beginning to be known as an assemblage of ideas and thoughts and intuitions and uh, instincts and so on that you you draw in uh, I, I put two pictures up there, Ruth's Connections and Rosie's Connections, Well, they're totally fictitious because I have no idea of what kind of assemblages they do when they're talking about clouds. But let, I've just put a picture there just to show the sorts of things that I'm indicating. Next one, please. Courtesy of my daughter, Rosie, who is, is, loves to create these um, pictures. Uh, but imagine assemblages, it, their pots are said, kind of, chaotic network of, of, of connections, uh, but they're, they're, they're always in flux. One of the things that is often said in the science education literature is that we have things called building blocks, basic ideas. And it, I, I'm, I'm railing against that. I don't think people have, I, I don't think science education in schools provides building blocks for people's lives later. I just don't think they do. I think kids in classrooms have a, a chaotic assembly of different kinds of thoughts and ideas. Um, and when you're talking to them, when you talk to kids, when you talk to even A-level students, um, undergraduates, and you're asking them general kinds of questions that have a science content to them, you can see them bringing those ideas together to try to form some kind of coherent response to you. Uh, but they're not there. They're not there as building blocks. Very seldom. Sorry, are they there as building blocks? Um, and, and when you when you try to recollect something, and, and that's a nice term to collect, and then to recollect something in terms of your own understandings, it it it, it is a creative assemblage. It's not something that was there before. you we all know that memory itself is reconstructed each time you try to remember something, so that. What happens when you're drawing these collections together is that you you creatively reimagine those um, in in a different slightly different form each time. Next one, please. And that is a lovely metaphor from from Deleuze and Guattari, where they talk about rhizomes. Rhizomes largely being sub underground or or, or subconscious. And there's some really nice work. One of the, I'm a great fan of, a, of, a, of an American uh, science educator called Andy De Sessa, who talks about the kind of instinctive ways in which we approach explanations of different kinds of things. So why why does things um, why are days longer in the summer than they are in the winter? What what what's happening in terms of seasons and so on? And people will respond. They'll draw those ideas together with a lot of of kind of subconscious thinking and ideas about how things work um, and so much of the rhizome is underground and it sprouts up willy-nilly hither and thither uh, in this in this rather sort of ad hoc manner 
which uh, then people try to bring together as they uh, as they try to form an explanation or response to a question. Next one, please. And there we are. Just a quick rundown that says something like these ideas. The so you've got some that are, are, are tacit, largely tacit. Some that are explicit. And as you're trying to form some kind of a, a, a response, what you're doing is is drawing the this, the upper shoots of the uh, the rhizome together to create this assemblage. I'm guilty of using a large number of metaphors here, and I'm not. I'm not. A, I, I'm unapologetic about it, in the sense that I'm trying to do exactly what I'm saying here is to create a picture that you, as as an audience, can actually sense where I'm going with this. That I'm trying to create this idea of people pulling together thoughts, images, uh, words, all of that to connect together in order to be able to create some kind of an explanation for the phenomena that we're we're talking about. Uh, next one, please, Margaret. I guess that the, the, the longer we, we're, we're all of us in in, uh, in the business of, of um, teaching, we're all of us in the business of trying to make something clearer to an audience for whom it isn't always clear. And I've 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 introduced a term there called a quantum of explanation. So when I was talking to my darling wife and, and daughter out on uh, the North Downs. I had to choose a, 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 an entry into clouds in that instance. I had to form a, a, what I called a quantum of explanation, and it's kind of a Goldilocks principle, which says I, I couldn't go too much, too quickly. I had to choose the size of what I was. So it was a conscious effort by me to assemble my thoughts in order to make an explanation for them and to do so in a way that... Uh, was not too long, not too short, um, not too deep, not too shallow, and so on and so on. Um, I had to, I had to try to address my audience as best as I could, uh, and and that seems to me to be one of the things that they're trying to do to me when I ask them a question. It, this exchange of ideas and thoughts as you're sitting over the kitchen table and you're you're, you're talking about things is is this business of trying to create an assemblage that has sufficient power to be able to do the job at hand at the time, and yet is not too big, not too small, and so on. But it, 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 it's a, a fleeting thing in the sense that it's mood dependent. I'm not in the mood for this, or I can't be bothered, um, or deep interest. Uh, Mike, I'm still, tell me more, give, give me more. That's, that's not uh, often said, by the way. <laughs> tell me more, tell me more. Um, but but people will pick and, and, and push at an idea because it, 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 they're trying to wrestle with it, as we often say. Um, making sure that I, I use the right words, um, that I'm, I'm displaying tolerance and patience while I'm doing this and not getting grumpy and bad-tempered. Um, and that I'm, I'm able to move around in my thinking fast enough to be able to respond to the things that, that, that they're saying and to what my audience needs. I'm sure it's true of all teaching um, in, in, in the sense that what you're trying to do during an undergraduate program or postgraduate program, it doesn't matter, is, is to marshal, literally to marshal your thoughts and your ideas in order to be able to meet the needs of an audience at, at, at a particular point in time. And another time it won't work as well. Uh, a different mood, it won't work. Their engagement matters, and they have to be prepared to to, to go with it. And the last point on that slide there is that com that, that they can cope with uncertain complexity, and uh, it, that that's not a given that people can actually wait out and think through and determine what needs to be done. And it, it, it it's uh, it, it's asking something of them to be able to do that. Uh, come back to that again in a moment. Okay, next one, Margaret, please. Because it does take cognitive effort, and cognitive effort again is an expression that's used a lot in the literature within science education. Just how much, just how much heavy lifting are you asking people to do? And it, it, it's a tough ask um, because, and as I point out in a moment science is is is, is obtuse it is difficult it, it's not intuitive 
um, and 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 it, it it does require that you actually stick with it. So when you come to the big S science end of my science life, these are people who have made that effort, have made the commitment, and can, and can deal with the uncertainty because you 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 know as well as I do that when you when you're listening to something and you're struggling with it that it's going to take you a while in order to be able to come to to, to reconcile your various different thoughts about it and it, it it's it, it does take effort and time now not everybody's willing to do that and so down at my small s end of the spectrum are people who are quite happy to give up very very quickly um conceptual change is not a skill it, it, it it's a dis it, there's a mood there's a disposition uh, you have to be able to tolerate complexity, indecision, um, uncertainty, and to live with it for a while in order to be able to sort your thinking out. And the greater the complexity, the harder the work. Margaret, please. Ah, yes, good. Meet more of them. Uh, Dylan, daughter Sean, her husband Andy, Joel, who's a self-confessed nerd. Let me tell you a little story. The dog... Um, it's not that not this dog, uh, but uh, their neighbor's dog was a puppy, liked chewing those uh, plastic bottles, uh, the drinks bottles that you, you, you get more drink water in and so on. And it chewed one of the, it loved to chew these things, sitting out on the lawn chewing them. And the pup died. It, it, some of the plastic lodged in its throat and the poor thing um, met its end uh, at the end of the plastic bottle. And it proved quite distressing for both uh, Dylan and uh, Joel. One of the consequences of that was that they, they began a kind of a little hate program about plastic, thinking that plastic was the, was the, um, the, 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 the villain of the piece that had killed the little dog. And so what they, they did was they challenged each other to find out a little bit more about the plastic, because I, I, I was saying, actually, do you know what? It probably isn't, the, you know, plastic isn't of itself. And they were going, no, 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 Mike, it really, and so on. So we, we, we there was a, a hint of challenge in there. Next one, please. And what they, what, what I was doing over the kitchen table was monitoring to some small extent the ways in which they began to engage with the idea of a plastic. What is a plastic? What are plastic? What do they make? Where do they come from? What, what's the, what, what, what what do, why, why do we have this thing called plastic pollution? What's it all about? And as they talked, you could see that there was things like BBC's Blue Planet. They had, they began to, to pick up photos of plastic. The, the, clearly, there was a lot of conversation between each other, all four members of the family and the dog to some extent. They, they involved their friends at school. Um, there were all sorts of different WhatsApp and Facebook things and so on. And Joel um, developed a, a top list of culprit nuisance plastics and, and, and a long list there that he put together. And Sean, my daughter Sean said, I've never realised there were so many polys, you know, poly this and poly that and polythene and polystyrene, polyethylene and da 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 da. And, and it was simply just a recognition of, of some of the issues that were involved in the word plastic. Next one. Over, please. And so I recorded, with their permission, of course, over the kitchen table, some of the kind of things that they were saying. Um, Andy is, is in business, and Andy runs his own business. Uh, he's, like many people, you would say, he's, he says, I'm really not very much into science. Sorry, Mike, I, I, you know that I'm not into science terribly much. I watch TV news and so on. I couldn't sit a science exam paper right now as if that was the uh, sort of um, apotheosis of, of, of doing science. And then he, he went on to talk about the way that the company he what he owns and runs is um, uses enormous amount of plastic. And that the, it's a, 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 an office cleaning company, so that they have a very big se several big contracts about cleaning offices. And he said that uh, a lot of the fluids that they normally use used to come in in metal drums now come in plastic and. He's suddenly aware of, of the plastic all over the place. Started trying to do without a plastic bag for the groceries and failed miserably. Next one. Margo, please. It often in these conversations goes back to school science. No, I don't remember much about school science. Um, 
it was just stuff you had to get through. I mean, who needs quadratic equations anyway? Well, I don't know. Um, science is better, I guess. You can always look it up. And her sentence was, two or three clicks and you've got it. So I don't care, I don't know. I can find it out in five minutes. True enough. And then she went on to do some more about plastics herself. Um, you know, single-use plastics. And um, she decided that, that it wasn't the plastic that was the problem. It was, of course, it was people that were the problem. And possibly um, allowing the little dog to chew the plastic had been the problem rather than the plastic itself. Who knows? Um, next one, please, Margaret. And Andy went even further. He began to look at the idea of food transportation and the extent to which plastic is used in moving food around the world and the use it has in doing so and began to think that, in fact, if we did without plastic, it would have a major impact on the, the movement of food around the world and the, food, the nature of food production. And he began to explore some of the, 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 the politics, if you like, of of plastics as opposed to just the, the, the chemistry of plastics, which is, I found fascinating listening to the way he was beginning to, 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 to work through some of the ideas and bring some of the ideas together in his own thinking. Next one, please. This is you. <laughs> Dear audience, I know you're all out there. I can see you <laughs> along the bar at the bottom of the screen. It, it, it's a question for you, and if you, uh, I don't want you to put your hands up, please, but if there's a chat facility, or maybe at the end, you, you might want to just uh, respond to me. Okay, it's a thought experiment. I have a snooker ball. Picture one. I drop snooker ball in glass of water. Picture two. I can measure the upthrust of the snooker ball in the glass. Thank you, Archimedes. It's simply just we can measure the rise of water and we can do the calculations that allow us to look at the upthrust on that snooker ball. Oh, oh, fine, so far, this is this is all standard stuff. You know that if you drop something in, it displaces the water and we can use that as a, as a measure. I now take the snooker ball. I, in an aeroplane over the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> I drop the snooker ball into the Pacific Ocean. Does it experience the same upthrust as it did in the glass? If it does, how do I know? If it does, how would I measure it? If it does, how would I explain it? <laughs> how do I explain that that ball dropped into the Pacific Ocean would experience an upthrust? That's your task. So at the back of your mind, as you're listening to the end of what I'm going to be saying now, I want you to have it in your mind that you have to explain how I can measure the upthrust of the snooker ball dropped into the Pacific Ocean. OK, that's it. Next next slide, Margaret, please. I'm going to leave you with that one. So no answers. But I'm hoping that you can appreciate that as soon as I ask a question like that, Science is, is, is an awkward animal. Science is a, a difficult beast. It's unclear. It's uncertain. Um, and big science people, big capital S science people, make that effort, make the effort to, to deal with all of this. Um, and, and you might say, why do they do that? Now, I think that's a very different question. Um, one of the things that uh, Saima and I have worked on is something called uh, the, the science lives of academics. And we've been looking at some of the reasons why some people do engage with science. At what age do they switch into science and so on? I'll leave that aside for a moment. But just know that there are people like ourselves, I'm sure, out there for whom big science is, is a reality. That this is, where they, this is where they position themselves. This is what they do for a living. But small science people, small s science people, um, back off. They resist. Uh, they're incurious. They, they, they just don't want to get engaged. They're just not feeling like it. So next slide, please. Margaret? Ah, thank you. Ah, thank you. I've, I've, um, I've, I've taken from um, Jonathan Osborne and uh, uh, Vanessa Kinn's um, work here, 
just just some of the the, the kind of uh, what they call the mobilization of dispositions to achieve science to, to achieve understanding. In order to be able to do science, you 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 you've you've got to pretty much hit most of those kind of um, points there. One, two, uh, six, seven, six. Um, hypothetical modeling, which is exactly what we were doing just a moment ago with this new cabal. A hypothetical modeling, probabilistic reasoning, historically based evolutionary reasoning, and so on. That this is their list, not mine, but it, it gives an, an indication, I think of what they call the six key ingredients of science. Uh, and, and they're not straightforward, they're not easy. So it, at one level, it comes as no surprise, of course. That's an unexceptional outcome from all my talk, is that people find these things difficult to do. You might want to turn this around and say, well, why do people do it? <laughs> What's in it for them? Uh, because clearly, for many people, there's, there's, no, there's no benefit, there's no, there's no reward. For, for getting involved in in those kinds of ingredients of science, there, um, the, the, this, it, 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 the outcomes are not worth the effort. It, it's a cost benefit issue, and it costs too much, and the benefits are too small to get engaged with science. So, dyscientia is a dispositional thing, in my view, in in, in that sense. Next slide, Margaret, please. And sure enough. <laughs> out there on the North Downs, or in the aisle in the Sainsbury's, or over the kitchen table, uh, people drew a line. Enough, enough, Mike. Oh, you know, stop now. Too much. Enough now, Sean. It gives me a headache. And, and Rose's, you know, fry my brain. <laughs> it gives you the sense that people actually really can go so far, but no further. And thank you very much indeed. That's the end of the explanation. That's that's done the job, or at least it's done the, enough of a job for now. Um, and it, it it isn't worth the effort. Uh, interestingly, there's something called low science resource capacity in the literature, which says something like you have a, 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 a definite amount of resource that you're going to allocate to this. And in dissentia, dissentia terms, that's that's quite low. You're not you're not prepared to invest in it very much. As I said before, you're not going to get very much out of it. Um, next slide, please. I'm coming to a close. So my sense of dissentia dis is at the weak end of my spectrum. So although you're pe all people are impacted by science at some level in their lives, uh, their engagement and their immersion in that is, is a, a very weak element of their lives. Perhaps it has, uh, as I say, poor assembly, um, low disposition, little organization of the ideas and so on. Understandably, but they're not interested, so they're not going to do it. They, they get nothing from it. Next next slide, please. OK, I, I'm, I'm not going to spend too, too, too long on this. Um, it really repeats pretty much what I, 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 I've already said. One of the fears that people have, certainly when I'm talking to them, is, is a kind of a, a, an imposter syndrome thing where, or a fear of being unmasked. I, I don't want to expose my, my vulnerability to you, my, my ignorance. So I'm not going to talk about it. Um, it I, I, <laughs> if you don't mind very much, I'm going to avoid this and talk about something else that I know I can talk about. Uh, they, there is a, a willingness to resort to slogans and catchphrases, you know, things like five a day or... Um, whatever it happens to be, there's a whole range of different kinds of little aphorisms that people use. Um, and I'm not sure that they know where they come from and so on. Next slide, please. Yeah, it, it, it's this issue of engagement and, and immersion. Uh, people suffer discomfort, embarrassment about not knowing and so on. Um, What I think I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm moving away from a general idea of public understanding of science and bringing it down to a people's understanding of science. So I've driven it down from a very broad sense of issues. I, I could drive it back up again in a moment, but I think what I'm trying to list here are some of the issues that around individual people, personal understandings of science and the, and the, the, the discomfort that people feel around that. It's real. 
and that, 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 that their discomfort is real. Next slide, please, Margaret. And you have to ask the question as to whether it's it's I can't understand or I won't understand as a willful act, um, or is it because I won't understand because I can't understand? And if I define dissentia, dissentia as low science resource capacity, it's that list there of unwillingness or an inability to, to or a, a low disposition towards categorizing, appreciating, reasoning, making leaps of scientific imagination, and so on. Next one, please. It's not, and, and I've just given a, a list of the sorts of things that we've had discussions about over our kitchen table at home. I, I'm sure you all know the five second rule. You know, you drop a sweet, how long have you got before you, while it's on the floor, before you pick it up and pop it back in your mouth again, or whatever it happens to be. We used to have this thing called the five second rule. Um, I'm never sure why, why was the, <laughs> what was that to do with? I mean, are germs going to hang around to, to um, you know, have six seconds before they jump onto the sweet or whatever it happens to be? Um, you know, why, and, and, and I was asked why, why one meter apart? Do we distance distance or two meters apart, whatever it happens to be? Atomic clocks and sat navs. Um, how does IVF work and what's a paternity test? I, I was rather discomforted when my son asked me that. So, <laughs> so I, um, I, I, I wasn't sure why, where that was coming from. Um, and so on. How's the touch screen work? You could look at those lists there and you could say well, do you know what I'm, I'm not really interested in why does a lizard walk at walls I, I, I you know I could I could take it or leave it really Mike if you don't mind I'm, I'm not sure that I need an explanation for that but nevertheless the, 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 the sort of things that we, we, we we've, that have come up in conversations and they as I say turn to to me sometimes largely to find some kind of response to that next one please here we are, we're back in Umbria. I'm closing down now. Um, as you can see, cloud formations are, are really very different at different times of the day. Um, the, 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 the fog that, and the mist that covers the, the, the river, the, the Tiber, um, as it runs through the countryside, and it just provides enormous conversations as to why, why, why does it happen? Why is it like that? I thought all clouds were up in the sky. No, they're not. Um, why are they all like and so on? Uh, next one, please. And look at the drama involved in that. I, I just, it. I suppose that at the point at which people are actually motivated to ask a question, um, are when there are when it impacts upon them, when science impinges on their lives. They, they begin to puzzle and look at it and they think, my word, that is a fantastic storm brewing. What is lightning? What is thunder? Why does that happen? Why and why and so on. And it, at those particular points, I have to have my assemblage ready in order to be able to address my audience <laughs> in a way that's going to meet their needs. Uh, next slide, please. I, I've put something there called it's a word that I've come across recently, and it, it, I meet it everywhere. Curation. I ha in my explanatory mode, I have to assemble my own thoughts, and I do. I'm conscious of the fact that I, I, I'm of what I'm doing. I, I'm bringing bits together, but then I have to curate it in a manner that is uh, that, that kind of way we talk about curation, which is which is that putting it together in, in a meaningful way in order to address issues and or a particular audience. So I curate my assemblage in order to create an explanation. I actually think that when I'm talking to undergraduates or postgraduates, it doesn't matter, that they do the same thing. I ask a question and I'm conscious of the fact that they, they lean back for a moment as they're, as they're thinking about bringing their bits together Framing it in a way that's going to respond to Mike's question and then generating that explanation. Next one, please. Okay. And I and I just I I, I put in two little quotes there. 
Um, one comes out of the explosions. Uh, the universe is dead for us, and how it is? How is it to come alive again? Knowledge has killed the sun, making it a ball of gas with spots. Knowledge has killed the moon. It's a dead little earth, fretted with extinct craters as with smallpox. The world of reason and science. This is the dry and sterile world that abstracted minds inhabit. And unfortunately, for, for many people, that, that really, really is the case. And you can see them shrinking away from it. And then I've left you with Johnny Mitchell. I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down. Still somehow, it's clouds illusions, I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. I think there's a last slide, Margaret, please. Mm -hmm. Meet Alexa, the one person <laughs> in my household who actually listens to me and pays attention and actually knows a lot of the answers. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. Oh, thank you very much, Mike. That's a very engaging and thought-provoking lecture. And we've all been asked to think about how a ball hundreds of the Pacific Ocean might be measured. And um, I'm sure even if we can't answer that question, we have other questions of our own that uh, you'd like to ask Mike. So let's take five or ten minutes um, to ask Mike some questions. Anyone like to kick off? I've put my hand up. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, so. yes, I can. Yes, Terence. Yeah. thank you. I'm oh, sorry, Ken. Yeah, <laughs> well, um, Mike, thank you very much for a very thought-provoking presentation. Um, I've got two comments. One is I think if we were coming not from a scientific background but from a linguistic background, I'm sure we would call this uh, dysglottia. And that is a, <laughs> a, a reluctance to consider you might speak another language and uh, difficulty to understand why we need to do it because English is the universal language. <laughs> now, there must, be, there must be commonality in the barriers and I think those are worth exploring because clearly from you know, the population's point of view, it would be helpful and particularly for us as teachers to understand this and to encourage perhaps a different approach starting at school and working through with the students that we have every day. Absolutely. I mean, there's a real contradiction, isn't there, between what, what at least my, what I believe uh, school science looks like and, you know, school biology, school chemistry, school physics and so on. And the amount of time I've actually spent, A, being a science teacher once upon a time and, and spending time in schools. That there is a very, that there's a, a, a strong desire to, to frame explanations, as I said earlier, in terms of the building blocks of science. And it's often that's something that's, that, that's a, a, a set of um, ideas that, that comes very readily to the, to the science teacher's tongue. Uh, we're setting the foundations. We're, 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 we're establishing ideas and so on that people can build on. And, and it's this sort of building metaphor. And I, I, I shrink from that. Um, I, I do think that what we ought to be thinking of is, is how can we ask young people to, to, to collate and, and to curate their ideas uh, so that we, they can respond to di different, particular different kind of issues that crop up in their lives. That's not the way that science is taught in schools. I, I, I certainly know that within, within university life, um, people have a much more developed and sophisticated ideas around all sorts of different things in education, which is my field at the moment. Um, but nevertheless, you know, if you ask questions, you can <laughs> you can see that sort of raking of the leaves to try to grasp what what, what their understanding is and, and, and collect it all together in, in a way that uh, is, is going to be meaningful, at least meaningful in, in, in the context in which we're talking. It doesn't always have to be meaningful, but still. So I, I, I think, yes, it's, it, it's not something that's a, you know, particular to science, I'm sure it crosses all of our disciplines right the way through. Margaret. Um, yes, thanks, Mike. It's very interesting. Um, the examples you gave, you know, explaining clouds to your family, um, I mean, you've terrified it um, anyway, but I think the thing is, don't you think the reason they say enough is enough is because you're trying to share with them many, many years of building blocks in a few minutes and they can't do all that building in that short time so i know we need to be able to explain science to other people but do you think that uh, there are sort of 
um, thinner routes to, to explain low clouds, high clouds. And so on. I mean, the beginning was, far, because I was talking about clouds to my grandchildren the other day, you know, about the fact that water vapors, you know, you can't see it and so on. But some things require so many prior explanations that you can't get them to the point of understanding that you're trying to. Yeah, you, 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 there's a mismatch between what I, I want to do and what they need, is what I think you're saying there, Margaret, which is basically that I've got this stuff in my head, which I want them to have. And, and they're, they're, they're sort of um, maybe not ready to... Readiness is possibly one of those things, but they're not quite ready to accept in, in the lump that I would rather like to transfer over to them. And I, I think that's true of, of, of many, again, rather what we were just saying a moment ago, you know, many different kind of disciplines. We've got all this stuff, we've got a curriculum, we, we've got books, we've got all this stuff, and you, we want you to have it. Uh, in you know, undergraduate terms, you know, we want you to have it in three years. Mm. <laughs> you know, this is it, you've got to get it all in there. You know, you've got to read all of this stuff, read Piaget in the original, whatever, you know. <laughs> you know, read, read Vygotsky in the Russian. You're quite right that there's a, a pressure, and I'm a guilty of adding that pressure to, to, to Ruth and to Rosie on, on, on the hillside there. There's a pressure to, to, for them to have my understanding. Uh, and you're quite right. There's a, there's a sense in which they, they can't, A, they couldn't do it, and B, they don't want to do it. Thank you very much indeed. That's not what I am, Mike. Go away. Um, and, and so when they say you're frying my brain or, you know, the, the, the enough is enough, I think you're, you're quite right. There's... There's just so much and, and no more. What I think I'm also talking about, though, is that for many, for, for, for those of us who, who go into the big science, big S science, we live with the uncertainty. We live with that. We live with the knowledge that there's more there than we know. We live in the knowledge that I don't know how these things work. But you know what? There's somebody, I know somebody who knows that there's somebody who knows. And so on. <laughs> what, what we can do is we trust, don't we? We trust to the level of expertise around us that says, actually, do you know what? I don't know, but I know a man who knows, as it were, or I know a woman who knows. And it's, um, it, I, I think what we do is we live with that, whereas other people are not prepared to. Mm. They're really not. Um, well, I, I have a question. Um, I wonder if, if the dissciencia individual is more um, prone to believe in misinformation and fake news about science. I'm, I'm thinking here about that very sensitive subject of vaccines yeah. and, and the, you know, some of the rumours that go uh, quite wrongly around about how they might create all kinds of um, health problems in their own right. And, and some people seem prepared to believe this and others don't. Full stop. You know, it's black and white. I, I, I think I, I, I'm sure that you're right. I mean, at the point when I'm sitting talking to people and I talk to them about, you know, the virtues of vaccination and so on, and, and you listen to some of the ways in which their ideas miss come together, in my view, they assemble their ideas and, and there's so much there to challenge. Um, it becomes counterproductive at some times, but even so, I'm absolutely certain you're right that... Um, you know, if you talk to flat earthers, why on earth would you believe the earth is flat? It's much harder work, in fact, to believe it's flat than to believe it's round, you know? <laughs> but <laughs> you know, it, it, it's really hard work to, to, to work. Go, I mean, I, I did sit with somebody not so very long ago who, who was a, quite a committed flat earther. And I just, I just, at the end of it, it was a series of convictions and beliefs, and I wasn't going to shape those convictions and beliefs, Janet. And so, to that extent, I, I gave up. You know, I walked away from, from that one. Um, but it, it does it does it does challenge your thinking quite heavily to be able to try and marshal the explanations you need in order to be able to argue why NASA <laughs> fake the moon landings. You know, it's hard. That is, as I say, it takes more mental effort to do that than to believe that actually mm. Matt did walk on the moon and so on. You know. Um, but it, it, so I don't. I'm not sure that that uh, misinformation alone is what's doing. But that kind of those those conspiracy beliefs mm -hmm. are beliefs, and they're they're an element of faith. And I'm not sure that rationality of of discourse in in my explanations is going to 
impinge on their belief systems, really. Beliefs are beliefs, I think. I, I have I, I have an enormous set of beliefs in, in science. I believe there are electrons. I've never seen one. I don't know that you know how easy it is to see an electron, but I believe they, they exist. So I'm, I'm I've got an equally staunch belief system, which is different to other people's belief systems. But yeah, okay, the the, the hard to the hard to work on belief systems. Janet, Pat's had her hand up a long time. I'm oh, sorry. I'm so sorry, Pat. Yes, please do go ahead. Thank you, Janet. I, I'll be brief because I know there's the AGM to follow very shortly. Thank you, Mike. A very thought-provoking talk. And in fact, my question builds on what, what Ken and Margaret and Janet have said. Um, and I, I was going to ask your reflection on technophobes. But interestingly, I think everybody will realise when they see what's written next to your name, guest, that is the key point, the key point as to why you couldn't put your... Um, PowerPoint up and Margaret isn't so she could put a PowerPoint up. It all depends on administrators. Sometimes a simple explanation, the key point. <laughs> oh, now we know. Thank you. That's so illuminating. A simple a simple point. So, None wait, of us wait, thought wait, of wait, it. Now, are, you, are, you, are you calling me a technophobe? Yes. To reflect on it. But I think you have reflected on it and I'm I'm uh, very relevant. Uh, very aware that the AGM is, is pending. Yeah, no. And you okay. came up with the explanation. I, I, that explanation, yeah. <laughs> well, um, look, before I draw this to a close, are you going to put us out of our misery and tell us about the um, ball that's dropped in the Pacific Ocean? Or do we have to... <laughs> But the, 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 the difficulty with it is that it, it relies upon an explanation of, of intermo intermolecular forces, because if you think about the displacement spread over the vast area of, of, the, um, of the Pacific, over the surface area of the Pacific, uh, it, 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 the, the, the ball probably wouldn't even lift it one atom's height. So you have to trade on the idea that all of the atoms and molecules that are in the Pacific Ocean are, are, are joined together by intermolecular forces that, that allow us to measure this thing. Um, but even in that sentence, um, Janet, you, I can, you know, I can feel you going, oh, all right, fair enough, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was probably more than I needed. <laughs> so yes, it, 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 it's not a straightforward one. And so um, answers on a postcard, please. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I'm going to pass over to Roger, who's going to just say a few words of, of thanks on behalf of the NCEP. Um, right. Roger, you're, you're muted. Oh. That, I'm muted. That norm, that doesn't normally happen. Right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you very much, Janet. And, and thanks very much, Mike. And also, just before I give a very short vote of thanks, just to say that I have been recording the lecture with a screen grab, uh, and I'll put it up, uh, if people don't mind, including the discussion, which I think was fascinating. Um, and I'll edit out any little glitches that were, that were there. And apologies to anybody who's watching this later for my wife and my grandson and various people communicating with me on WhatsApp, which popped up on the screen. You won't have seen it, but I did. Right, well, th thank you very much, Mike. I, I really wanted to know what Dissiencia was. I didn't know. Uh, I'd never thought about it before. And, of course, being troubled by science. And I was going to congratulate you initially for managing to avoid COVID, but you did manage to, you did get it in there. And it's almost impossible to avoid because I think that what's happened is that COVID has, as you said, it's really impinged on people's thinking. And I get the impression from the press and from politicians and from relatives and people I speak to that now everybody's a scientist, you know, the, uh, and it's been brought to the fore. Uh, but of course, it depends how they use that. I mean, if you look for example, uh, how do face masks or do face masks work, which is one question you raised, you know, look on Google and you'll get a very different answer from if you look at the uh, at the systematic reviews, for example. I don't want to I don't want to enter into that argument, please. But I'm just saying that the, there are different levels of evidence there. Um, but I mean, dyscencia is a very it's a very real and present phenomenon. Uh, I, I, um, I, I, I tend to like I've had a scientific training. I tend to like to to go for evidence and with my family and my children, my wife, some of them are scientists, too. Uh, but I, I, my, the answer I often get is, oh, you and your evidence, you know, <laughs> obsessed with evidence as well. There's nothing wrong with that. But anyway, um, so I sense a kind of science exhaustion almost amongst people when we try to push it. And I think you brought you brought that out yourself. 
So I think it is it is it is important to try to help people. Um, you, you know, because uh, the pandemic's brought science to the fore. It's also brought some absolutely barking mad people to the fore. And I'm not referring. I'm not going to name them, but I will. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about the David Ikes of this world. I'm talking about many doctors and nurses and other people uh, who are. And I'm quite. I'll have to put my cards on the table. I'm quite sceptical about the way we've handled COVID. But there's an extreme element to all this of people who are just peddling nonsense, uh, utter nonsense. Uh, and I thought your point about science in schools was very good. Watching how my children learn science and how diff different it was from the way I learned science. They don't seem to learn from first principles these days. And I thought your chaotic assembly was very good. Again, we're given the facts, we're given the end product of science, but not the not the method to develop our thinking uh, uh, and, and to get there. Because um, science is a method, it's, it's, it's a way of being, it's a way of thinking, not a series of facts. So I wanted to congratulate you um, First of all, uh, and thank you for the lecture, and I congratulate you for finding a quote from Lady Chatterley that was quotable without offending people. But uh, <laughs> I've actually never read the book. My wife took it off the shelves, but uh, one of these days. But say, uh, and I wasn't really so interested in whether the snooker ball displaced the water. I was wondering if there was no one there, would there be a splash? But that's another <laughs> that's another discussion. <laughs> okay, so Mike, so thanks very much. You've helped us to see through some of the uh, the maze of this problem or this issue of dissentia and I'd like to thank you very much on behalf of the uh, of the NCUP uh, so thank you yeah, thank you okay.